Meet yourself and say hi. Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, hey. Uh, you're a little quiet. Maybe we can, can we get Greg's volume? Um, sorry, is this better? Yeah, that's noticeably better. Headphones have been through the wash one too many times. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, is this okay? So I, I can't I can't see you, but if there are questions, then please um uh you know please uh please scream. Yeah. Yeah, we actually have a, a better mic that I will run over to people who have questions. Okay, okay. Um okay. You don't and, have your slides yet. Oh sorry, you don't you don't see them. No, we do not. Oh. Is this working? Yeah, now we're there. Okay, perfect. Um. Okay. Uh, we have Greg Valiant from Stanford on charting the landscape of memory data trade-offs and continuous optimization. Take it away, Greg. Okay, well, yeah, thank, thanks so much for inviting me. And yeah, sorry, sorry I couldn't be there today. Um, so I guess I'll talk about a few things. Um, and I've been thinking about these uh, sorts of questions with um, Annie Marsden, who's um, a PhD student, um, uh, Vatsal Sharan, who, uh, who was a PhD student, I guess, and just started uh, his faculty job at USC and um, and and Aaron. And so rather than um, telling you about specific kind of technical details of any one result, I wanted to give the sort of bird's eye view of the landscape with a sort of emphasis on some of the open uh, questions. So everything in this talk should be understand, you know, should be understood by everybody uh, in the room who, who wants to understand it. Um, so stop me if that's not the case. Good. So the basic question um, is how do um, constraints on the amount of memory that an algorithm has influence the amount of uh, data or the convergence rates um, for sort of fundamental learning or optimization questions? And I guess today, um, since it'll be helpful to have a very concrete uh, sort of problem in mind, um, we'll focus on just linear regression. Um, or maybe more, uh, uh, even more specifically, just solving um, a system of linear equations. And most of what we say will extend to, um, you know, to larger families of learning problems or uh, uh, more general convex optimization. But let's let's focus on this one uh, specific question. And there are two there are two sort of different models in which you can ask these questions about how memory influences. Um, you know, the speed of learning. So one is the setting of um, where you have access to independent data samples, and the other setting is a self code model. So in this first setting, where you have access to independent data samples, um, the problem will be formulated in terms of some distribution over, um, over data points. So here, maybe a pair AB, where A is some uh, vector and B is some you know, real valued label. So maybe A is chosen according to some d-dimensional Gaussian, and maybe B is the inner product of A with some mystery vector X, and the goal will be to learn X. And here we think of an algorithm with bounded memory as, well, it has a modest amount of read-write memory, and whenever it wants, it can say, give me a new data point. And this data point is gonna be drawn according to this uh, specified distribution. On the other hand, the cell probe model um, is um, you know, similar, but here the examples are going to sit in some possibly quite large read-only memory. So there's some read-only memory full of uh, data points. And again, the algorithm will have some um, access to a modest amount of read-write memory. And whenever the algorithm wants uh, you know, to, to get some data, it just needs to query this read-only memory. So it'll say, you know, what's the 30-second uh, you know, bit in the 75th data example, and so on. And within the cell probe model, there are, there are different variants. So some, you know, sometimes you can probe individual uh, 
you know, elements of each data point. Sometimes you sort of ask for the whole data point, um, but by and large, uh, um, the kind of different variants within the cell pro model basically um, uh, aren't so different. Okay. Um, good, so these are two different models of, um, uh, in which you can start asking these questions about net learning with bounded numbers. So um, beyond these two models, there are two different, two kind of very different settings that we might want to think about. So one is a discrete setting, for example, where we're trying to solve um, some system of linear equations over say a finite field. And the other is a continuous setting where we're doing, um, you know, we're solving some linear system over the reals or we're doing regression or some more general convex optimization. So I wanted to give um, a specific so specific problems for each of these four uh, boxes, at least so we um, have a very concrete sense of sort of what, what we're talking about. Okay, so in this um, setting where we're given sort of independent data samples um, in the discrete setting, um, one sort of very natural and standard problem one might think about is the question of learning a parity. So the universe is selected a length d um, binary vector x, and say it's chosen uniformly at random from the set of uh, you know, lengthy binary vectors. And then each data point um, consists of a length d uniformly random binary string together with a label, which is going to be the inner product of this, uh, you know, this vector ai with the secret vector x, inner products are taken mod two. Okay, and the goal is going to be to find x. So you can think about this as there's a random linear system over F2, and you're given examples you know, consistent with this uh, linear system. So the analogous problem in the cell probe setting, um, you know, it, it's really the, the same problem, except here, um, the data points, these AI comma the inner product of AN and X mod two are given in some read-only matrix. And you know, they can be accessed on demand. And you, know, you could think of this cell pro model setting where you have maybe you know, on the order of n data, sorry, on the order of d data points. Maybe you could think about it in the setting where you have on the order of d squared data points. Or maybe you can think about it as there's kind of an infinite number of data points. And whichever ones you want to look at, you can look at. Oh, Greg, can I just ask you a question? Uh, in the cell probe model, so does this mean that you can choose which A you want to look at? Uh, no. Um, so there is a matrix in which maybe these A's have been filled in at random, mm -hmm. but then you can specify in terms of the indices of this matrix, which elements to read. Okay. So the universe so has, has filled this read-only memory with random examples like from this distribution. And then you can say, you know, give me the first bit of the first example. Give me the eighth bit of the 12th example. So but you this, don't... Mean, this means that you can come back again? Yes, yes. Ah. So, so, so it doesn't disappear if you need the memory. Okay. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, so, so, so great. The, the main difference between these two uh, models, in some sense, the only difference between them is that in the cell probe model, if you want to go back and you know, look at the first example again, you just ask for it again. In the sort of, you know, IID data uh, model, the only way you can go back and see the first example again is if you use your precious memory to store that example. And if you decide to forget that example, you can never go back and ask for that example again. Um, right. So, so from a kind of practical standpoint, um, you know, I mean, in reality, we're sort of between these two models and that, you know, if you think of like a big machine learning application, maybe you have a, some hard drive that's really slow, full of your data. And if you really want, you can, you know, ask for your same data points back again, but, um, but maybe that's kind of expensive and you should think of it instead as, you know, you don't plan to kind of go back to this, uh, slow big database, um, you know, too many times. Um, any other questions, I guess, um, say the, uh, the cell probe versus the 
IID data sample setting. This IID data sample setting, I mean, I should call it kind of the streaming setting, only, um, you know, each example is picked independently from this distribution that we're defining. It's not some adversarial stream or anything. Um, uh, great. So in the cell probe model, are, are you going to be paying for the accesses or for the total amount of data? Like, is the, I'm trying to understand if the, the differences here is just that I'm allowed to go at the same point twice, but it does cost, co cost me twice. Like, you know, it's the same price as if I access two independent points, but I'm somehow gaining because it's the same point. Or is it you're going to leverage the fact that you can go back for free? Um, so it's, uh, so we will pay for every access. So, so it costs you to go back. Um, although, although I guess, I, well, uh, yeah, I don't want to spill the beans yet, but, um, uh, but, but yeah, so, so in the cell probe setting, the cost is going to be the total number of queries we make, the number of like, times we access our read-only memory. Um, and, uh, and then in the IID setting, the so cost will be the number of data points we end up looking at. Yeah, these are great questions. Any, any other uh, questions on this one? So in the continuous setting, um, the sort of analogous problem is as follows. So we're given, or the universe has picked some, say unit vector in um, R to the D, chosen uniformly at random from the sphere. And you know each data point, say is a random unit vector together with its inner product with the secret vector x. And here the goal is going to be to, you know, to find x or to approximate x. Say we want to return a vector whose inner product with x is at least you know, one minus epsilon. And these, um, right. And the analogous problem in the cell probe setting is again the, the sort of the same thing, only now these, uh, you know, data points are in some you know, read-only memory that we can access uh, you know, and on demand. And in particular, like the, you know, the first data point never disappears, we can go back and vary it. Um, okay. And again, in the cell probe setting, um, you, know, you can ask, well, do you get this data point to infinite precision? Do, are you charged per bit of the thing that you ask for? Um, and it's, it's not gonna matter too much, uh, the details on how you define it. Okay, um, so I should say before going on that um, there are many other interesting models you can think about, um, in particular models where there's no ac direct access to data points, but instead you interact with them via different sorts of oracles. So for example, statistical query access, where you get to dream up functions and you ask for the expectation of these functions uh, you know, over the randomness of your data distribution. Um, in optimization settings, you can also think about things like a function evaluation um, oracle, where um, you get to come up with some data point and you're given the um, sort of the loss of this data point, the, um, or things like gradient queries. And there's been a lot of work, um, um, so notably lower bounds, for learning tasks under these specific types of, um, you know, sort of Oracle models. Um, but somehow the, you know, the, the more general setting where we're just asking, you know, no, you actually get to see the data points and what can you say given different amounts of memory, um, there's been sort of uh, less work in that setting in part because it's, it's, it's more difficult than proving things for these more restricted types of uh, data. Okay. Okay, so we're just going to go through these um, these four squares and say a little bit about um, what's going on. Okay. So starting with this. So again, the universe has picked an unknown d-dimensional binary vector. Um, we're given a stream of examples of random binary vectors and their inner product with the mystery mod two, and our goal is to find this mystery vector. So there are two sorts of kind of obvious algorithms. So one of them is Gaussian elimination. Say we take two times D examples with all but inverse exponential probability 
this linear system over F2 will be, um, uh, um, you know, will be, will be full ring. And so we can just solve this. And this would take um, on the order of D squared memory. We will, need on, you know, we will need order D examples and each example is order D bits. Um, so using or, order D squared memory, we can just do our Gaussian elimination and solve this linear system over F2. On the other hand, one can still solve this problem with only a linear amount of memory by a kind of brute force, uh, you know, brute, brute force guess and check. So imagine we just iteratively guess each of the two to the D possible vectors for X. And for each guess, we're going to check, do the next you know, 10 D examples, are the next 10 D examples consistent with our guess? If they are, then probably this guess is the true X. Otherwise, we move to the next X. And this, this only requires you know, D memory. All you need is an, enough memory to store the guess X and count up to, um, count up, up to order D. So, um, and the question is, is there anything between these two? So is there, you know, with less than D squared memory, can you still get away with you know, a linear or polynomial number of examples? Um, so in 2015, um, with Jacob Seinhardt and Stefan uh, Wadger, um, we had this conjecture that any algorithm that uses less than D squared over four memory would end up needing to see an exponential number of examples to learn X with any significant probability of success. Um, and this was proved by Ron Ross in, in 2016. Um, okay, so I'll say a couple words about how, you know, about the intuition for why this is true and about how it's, or how to think about this sort of thing. Um, but first I should say that there's, um, you know, there's been quite a lot of subsequent work um, extending this sort of result to a broader class of learning problems over finite fields. Um, and at this point, I guess we have three fairly distinct types of proof for this sort of result. Um, and you know, the proofs of these things are, are, you know, are really beautiful. Um, and if you, if you, uh, um, you know, are interested in this sort of stuff, I, I strongly suggest you go to um, Sumega Garg's talk, which will be on Thursday, um, talking about some of her recent work on this. Okay, so, um, Intuitively, what's going on with this sort of conjecture? So, yeah, how are you possibly going to find this, uh, this unknown X? Well, suppose I give you one data point, then you know, given this data point, you say, well, before I saw this data point, X could have been any one of these uh, two to the D possible vectors. Now that I've seen this data point that restricts the possibilities of the true X to some D minus one dimensional subspace. Give it another data point, as long as it's not, you know, sort of in the span of the first x, um, of the first data point. Um, now your sort of posterior over what the true x is is well. Now it could be, you know, something in a d minus two dimensional subspace, and so on. So it seems intuitively like the only way you can make progress on this problem is to either keep track of the sort of subspace spanned by your examples or the subspace in which the, the linear subspace in which the potential X's exist. And you know, you're starting off where the, you know, the true X could be anywhere in this D-dimensional linear space. Um, and intuitively, either you keep track of a basis for the space or you keep track of a basis for the orthogonal space. And either way, you need to kind of go over this hump in the middle where you're trying to keep track of some sort of basis of some random D over two dimensional subspace. And in that case, it's kind of no way of compressing the basis for such a space. Um, so Ron Ross's original proof kind of formalized this intuition that your algorithm really needs to be keeping track of linear subspaces. Otherwise it's, it's kind of uh, almost hopeless anyway. And if you're keeping track of linear subspaces, well, there's no way around this pump where you see at some point you need to keep track of basically a basis of order D, D dimensional vectors, which takes quadratic space. Um, 
Okay, so again, I guess, you know, slightly more, so I'm not, I'm not gonna give it intuition for the proof. I just wanted to give one slide on sort of how to, how to start thinking about these sorts of questions, um, which is thinking about memory via uh, branching programs. So think of a branching program. So all, you know, your, our algorithm is going to be represented by this branching program where there's a start state here on the left, each column of states corresponds to potential states that our algorithm will be in after seeing the corresponding number of examples. So after seeing one example, our, our state of our algorithm will, will be one of this, these um, uh, memory states in the first column. After the second example, it will be one of these memory states in the second column and so on. Each of these memory states has a transition function. So if we are in this memory state here, and we see example uh, a2, b2, then we'll, then we'll transition to this memory state. If we had seen a different example, maybe we, we transition to this memory state. Um, it's also worth uh, mentioning that um, uh, there's no point considering randomized branching programs that they won't be any uh, more effective. Um, so given this sort of branching program, if we have an algorithm that has at most k memory, then at every time step, the algorithm can be in at most two to the k can be in one of at most two to the k different memory states. So if you want to have a lower bound against memory k algorithms, it suffices to argue that any branching program that solves the problem is going to need to have at least you know, width either at least two to the k, or will need to be super long. We'll need to see tons of examples. And again, for every uh, memory state here. You could ask, conditioned on us arriving at this state, what's the posterior distribution over possible exits? So given that we're here, what, you know, which, which true x do we think we started with? And if the algorithm solves the problem you know, by this time with good probability, it must mean that you know, most of these memory states have a highly peaked uh, posterior. Okay. Um, and then the question is just how do you argue that you either need you know, a wide or a long branching program? Um, okay. Um, uh, and, any, any quick questions on this? Uh, yeah, Greg. Um, sorry. So, Greg, uh, I don't know if this is a too eclectic, but uh, this is gap between d squared over 20 and d squared over four. Do you yeah. have any speculation about what happens in between? Oh, uh, yeah, the answer is d squared over four. Um, <laughs> uh, but but um, yeah, so yeah, I don't think it's hopeless kind of closing this. And this 20, uh, uh, it might not actually be 20. I'm not quite sure what they, uh, what's proved. But I don't think it shouldn't be so hard to prove something close to the right answer is my guess. But, but uh, um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, and something like d squared over two, you can make like some Gaussian elimination algorithm that's a bit clever with how it uses the memory to do that. So. Okay. Okay, so let me very briefly talk about what happens in the cell probe setting. So um, in the cell probe setting, suppose we have order D um, examples in this read-only memory, then actually um, it turns out that it's pretty easy to solve this, even with just linear space and a, pol a polynomial number of queries. And basically this follows from the fact that there are um, no, they're nice circuits, they're nice formulas for um, actually any coefficient of the characteristic uh, function of a, of a matrix. So if I give you some formula in terms of the entries of, uh, um, of this read-only memory, you don't need very much you know, read-write memory to evaluate this formula because you can just recompute. You know, if I want to add up two expressions, I can you know, sort of... Uh, compute this expression and then just store that number and then compute this expression from scratch and store that number and then add these two things up and store that. And so you can just keep recomputing the parts you need 
and, you know, and use almost no, uh, you know, um, use almost no memory for this. So, um, you know, I, I guess this, this really gets back to the point uh, that someone made earlier that the key difference between the cell probe model and this other setting is that you can, you know, it's really that you can go back and reuse the same examples. And crucially, like the fact that these are the same examples, they're not so sort of, uh, shifting, um, uh, really completely changes the landscape of this sort of optimization cluster. Um, and in some sense, it's fortunate that this cell pro, you know, this question in the cell probe setting is so easy because, you know, in general, proving lower bounds in the cell probe model is sort of notoriously hard. And in many cases, it turns into questions about, uh, you know, basically equivalent to, sort of, you know, P versus NP um, you know, from the point of lower bounds. Um, you know, often you, you know, these cell probe model lower bounds turn into question of do certain polynomials not exist, which, uh, which starts to get very difficult. Um, in contrast, in this IID set uh, data samples setting, these memory lower bound questions, they're less like P versus NP and a bit more like just information theoretic uh, questions. And, you know, in information theory, there are hard problems, but there's nothing like the kind of black hole of P versus NP. So um, anyway, I guess that was one reason why we were optimistic about being able to solve things in this left column, whereas in the right column, uh, lower bounds seem harder. Okay, uh, let's see, do I have five more minutes or what? Let's yeah, see. five more minutes is good. Okay, okay. so let me, let me move on to this square. Um, so this is sort of the analogous question in the continuous setting. So very briefly, um, you know, linear regression is obviously super important from a practical standpoint. And the sort of broader context is that from an optimization standpoint, um, you know, a huge class of optimization um, the research can be thought of as trying to find algorithms that in some sense use only linear memory while behaving like algorithms that have, that sort of use quadratic memory and use second order information about the problem and have, um, you know, in many cases, significantly uh, faster convergence rates. Most of this effort in the optimization community isn't posed explicitly in terms of uh, memory, but I think, I think it's sort of a helpful perspective to, uh, to think of it as just this. Can you come up with linear memory algorithms that behave like, you know, so Newton-like second order uh, algorithms that typically use quadratic memory? Um, um, so, so let's think about this linear regression question. The universe has picked a random unit vector. Each data point is a random either unit vector or uh, you know, something drawn from a, a isotropic Gaussian. And we are given the inner product with the um, you know, hidden vector, maybe with some very, very small amount of noise. So here the two extremes are given D data points. If we store them all and do Gaussian elimination, then we end up using memory D squared with say some logarithmic dependence on the desired accuracy in terms of bit precision. And we can solve the problem. So, so D data points for quadratic memory. We can also just do gradient descent. We can do kind of the most optimized gradient descent, the, the Kazmarsh style uh, gradient descent. And there we can get away with just basically linear memory with some logarithmic dependence on one over epsilon to keep track of significant bits. And there um, you know, we end up paying this log one over epsilon. So log, log one over the desired accuracy. And you know, there's a question of, is there anything in between? Is there anything between you know, order D memory and order D squared memory? So we had this theorem um, with uh, Vatel um, and Aaron back in 2019 where we showed that actually um, at least something breaks if you go from quadratic to subquadratic memory. Namely, that when you go to subquadratic memory, you will need at least some um, you know, dependence on this error. You'll need at least um, you know, D times log log one over epsilon data points. Hey, Greg, should, sorry, does the, this Gaussian elimination, D squared log one over epsilon and D log one over epsilon makes gradient descent look strictly better. Is there, is the log one over epsilon somewhere that it shouldn't be? 
or am I super confused? Sorry, uh, no, no. So the number of data points for Gaussian elimination is only D. But oh, you need memory D. Okay, squared. okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Right. So memory D squared, D data. And, you know, whereas, you know, you can uh, pay a log one of epsilon in data points and get rid of the D in memory. Right. So gradient descent looks much better, right? If you care at all about memory. But if you care about data, then you know, maybe Gaussian elimination is okay. Thanks. Yeah. Right. So, um, so we proved that at least something breaks when you go, you, know, you, you, um, you need at least some, you know, some dependence on the error when you go to uh, subquadratic memory. Um, let me just do this. Okay. Um, and you know, it's a bit embarrassing that we can, that we have two logs here. And the conjecture is that, you know, kind of the, the relatively basic um, gradient descent is optimal for any subquadratic memory algorithm. So the conjecture is given less than d squared space. You, you need at least d times log one over epsilon data points uh, without this log log. Um, and you might say that, well, you know, like these log one over epsilons, is this, you know, this isn't, uh, this doesn't interest me. This is kind of, you know, log stuff shouldn't matter. And, and that's okay. Um, so there's also the, so we have the following conjecture too that says, well, if your data is drawn from an ill-conditioned Gaussian, an unknown um, Gaussian with a very high condition number, um, then actually you either need enough space to store basis for this, for this kind of Gaussian to learn and store basis for this, in which case you can just have an algorithm that has a um, poly logarithmic dependence on the condition number. Or if you have subquadratic memory, too little to store a basis for this Gaussian, then you're doomed to have a polynomial dependence on the condition number. Um, so, so this second con conjecture, I think, is, uh, is maybe the more interesting one. Um, and it, uh, it's probably also a bit hard. Okay, just a very last comment. So um, in the cell probe model, you, um, it's definitely worth thinking about this continuous setting. Again, this is, this is kind of the model in which at least some uh, machine learning is happening where you have a database with your data. And if you want, you can ask for the same data point over and over again. And in this setting, um, you know, the conjecture is that, well, oops, yeah. no, 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 what happened? But the conjecture is that, um, uh, you at least need super linear space in order to solve this problem. Um, however, I think this sort of thing might be extremely hard to prove, again, because so cell probe uh, lower bounds start to look like, you know, you're proving that uh, certain so classes of polynomial don't exist. And the, it, start lo it starts looking much more like P versus N. And I guess just a point is that you, know, you could, in this continuous cell probe setting, you could still try to apply the same algorithm as in the discrete cell probe setting, but there you are doing this kind of formula in terms of binary things over F2. And in that case, everything is, uh, you know, you don't need to worry about arithmetic precision. Over the reals, when you start to do that, that sort of algorithm where you recompute all the terms of your formula as you need them, basically you're, um, uh, you know, without having at least a polynomial um, pr like precision, you end up with um, just arithmetic errors blowing up in your face. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so, so, so this, this bottom right square, I think is actually super interesting. Um, I know I say this is a conjecture, although uh, it's more of a guess. Um, so I think it might even be worth thinking about that from an algorithmic standpoint, uh, as well as the lower bound side. Okay, so that's, um, I guess that's it. Greg, let's uh, round of applause for Greg. Since we're running over schedule, maybe we'll do the following. I'm going to stand up here with this with this uh, hot mic, and anyone who has questions for Greg, maybe we'll keep keep him on the Zoom for a little bit, and but we'll let we'll go to the break so that we can come back on time at three forty for the last session. Thanks, Greg. Super nice Thank talk. You. Yeah, here's Nazi. Hey, Greg. Hi, it's Nazi. Oh, yes, actually, I don't know.
You can see us. So how is this related to the, I'm trying to figure out the relation between cell probe and first order. Because first order, I mean, you can definitely simulate first order with cell probe, but you need to probe the entire metrics. Mm -hmm. Right, so in cell probe, in first order here, you'd get to query specific, X specific, um, specific Z's and get back eight A Z, right? Something like that. Yeah. Sorry, for, for first order. Um, so, you know, we looked at, uh, you, you know, our open problem for first lim memory yeah. limited first order, right? Yeah. So I'm just, so I'm trying to figure out how the first order relates to cell probe. Um, <laughs> so, so, so in this language, first order corresponds to you can, you can't, you don't access entries of A, right? But you can give me a vector Z and I'll give you A times Z. Yeah. Right? Um, right, so, so again, like if you're trying to... Um, with, with linear, with, sorry, it's Sam. With, with linear auxiliary space, like if I, can't I compute that in cell probe? Like I, like I just... But that will cost you, uh, right. So the question is whether you care about Different polynomials in D. I mean, that would cost you. It cost me in query. You, so you, you do. You, yeah, but let's. Okay, that's going to be so challenging. So let's like. I don't. I think the point is like you want to worry about being fine grained on the space, and you don't right. want to be worried about different polynomials right. in D. Right. right. Yeah. Well, but the thing is that the thing is that whether that's more limited or whether I'm more lo looking because you can simulate that with D squared, mm -hmm. but the other way seems less clear how to simulate. Maybe but, it's also possible. But, but, but sorry, but yeah, with IID data, you know, uh, you can also simulate your gradient things, right? IID, what do you mean? So not wait, what, Nati, what is the model you have in mind? Like, the model you have in mind is you have a fixed, you have a fixed A. B, so you have a problem AX, it's worst case, worst case over AX minus B. Yeah, maybe that is the difference. So you have worst case, I mean, the way actually we, we looked at it is not for quadratic, it's for uh, general convex, general but, convex yeah. but, but it's even for quadratic, it's open, right? So you have, a, you have an unknown A and B. The B part is, is kind of easy, but you have an unknown A and B, so AX minus B. Mm -hmm. You want to solve AX, uh, AX equals B or minimize, you know, uh, X AX minus B, um, uh, whatever minus, you, minus you BX. Want a, and you want an unconditional lower bound on the number of first order gradient queries. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And again, remember, so we know, so the thing is that here in this case, you can do it with uh, D log one over epsilon queries, but for that you need quadratic memory, yeah. right, with uh, or, you know, D squared log one over epsilon memory, or you can do it with uh, D over epsilon squared or D over condition number, depending on, you know, whatever you want to either way, right, right? Yeah. Um, and, and then you only need linear memory. Um. So, so I was going to say, so one thing sort of between these models I didn't talk about is you can also think about, you have this matrix A, but you just get, um, yeah, you just get random rows. And, you know, the question is, do you need to pay this extra kind of D factor? Wait, if you get random rows, what's the in that in the IID case? Um, well, so, so, it samples how, uh, um, so, so you get random rows, but from this matrix. So like, if you, if you will, the worst case, but when you make a query, you don't query, you don't say, I would like row I, you just say, yeah. give me a row and but the algorithm gives you a random. Do you get the, do you get the index or not? Um, Cause if you don't, my guess is if you don't get, if you get the index, maybe you can exploit that. If you don't get the index, I would be surprised actually, if that makes it any easier. Right? Because if I don't get the index, yeah, yeah, you, you're saying I, it's no different than... It um, doesn't seem so. Like, I don't have a proof on the top of my head, right? But it somehow, if I don't get the index, how do I exploit the fact that I might have seen this row before? Right? I, I don't know, right? My memory doesn't tell me if I saw this row before. So, so, so I was going to say, in the case, in either case, say you do know the index. Okay, now if you know the index, then I can see how that helps you. But, okay, okay, but then the question would be like, Say so you go from, you know, order D data points to actually like order, you know, D square data points. That does the runtime get worse because you're sitting waiting for the same example to crop up again? Yeah. <laughs> right? 
Um, yeah, that is strange. Right? Even if they're given in like a random order and, you know, things are kind of decently conditioned. So right. it's not like yeah. you need to, you know. Um, yeah, so, so um, yeah, I guess the, sh the short answer is I'm not really sure. Although uh, I have been thinking a bit about, about your, uh, your open question. And I, and I, think, I think we have, like, we, we have something that's not really what we would like, but we have sort of some, something like what you are conjecturing oh, yeah, that's to true. the gradient oracle. So, but in that, so you think you can, as in you have a lower bound there? So, so yeah, sort of, it's, it's not, a, let's see. Uh, there's one way in which it's not really what we were hoping for, but. Um, because here you suggested that you think there's actually a, the possibility of a, a positive result in algorithm, but, but that's probably not um, implementable just with the first order. You really need the probes. Yeah. Yeah. So right. So this is kind of going via some weird polynomial types. Right, and that you cannot. You're not going to be able to implement that with first order, right? No, no. Right. Um, but 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 again, like uh, yeah. When I say like there might be an algorithm here, like you know, I, I don't know. Like like, uh, like I don't think there is, but there might be. Yeah. Um, okay. Like. Uh, uh, you know, proving that, you know, polynomials of some form, like, have this, like, weird error correction property. Like, proving that such polynomials don't exist sounds, sounds you know, extremely hard, right? Um, but they might exist, because, like, weird stuff. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to I'm gonna run out and get some water before the next session. Thanks for, thanks for the talk, Greg. Super sure, awesome. Can you, not, can you just turn this off and look at that? Sure. So, Greg, do you think that... Yeah. I, I mean, do you think that our, our problem, like the, with the first order, do you think you get into things that are as hard as P and P? I mean, I, it somehow yeah. still seems to me, that seems to me information theoretically approachable. Like yeah, not yeah. have any idea how to approach it, but. Uh... Um, yeah, no, no, I, yeah, I don't, I don't think so. Because basically because, you know, you can design these instances where um, um, you, you can design these instances where like one example or like one row of this matrix will like dominate your gradient up until you sort of, uh, you know, unless you know it, right? Like you can, do, you know, these convex problems where like you kind of need to be, you know, orthogonal to all these rows. Otherwise the gradient is just, you know, the highest index row that you're not orthogonal to, right? Yes. I'm um, not sure. I'm... Um, like, let's see, so, so say I want to be orthogonal, um, like, how do you exploit the memory constraint? I mean, what you're saying seems like I could do, I mean, that oh, you're just so, reconstructing a D, the D log one of reps on lower bound without memory, right? But like, I'm not sure uh, how. Oh, oh no, no. So, so basically the claim is like, unless you're filling your memory with like these rows of the matrix, yeah. then you're basically just getting the same garbage back from the Oracle. Like if you forget yeah, but, any. Right, but that's it. Uh, so maybe we are saying the same thing. So that's an information theoretic argument. That's not like, uh, um, I mean, you, in the talk, you said that somehow in the cell probe model, mm -hmm. that pro you lose the ability to do simple information theoretic arguments and then you resort to things that look like P not equal to mm -hmm, NP. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering what your intuition is for the first order, which sits somewhere in between them, right? I mean, is that yeah. amenable to, do you feel um, like that, that is amenable I, to more information theoretic I, approaches or? I think so, I guess, because you can construct these, these examples where okay. like. Okay, okay, good, good. So we are saying the same thing. Okay, yeah, so yeah, we're yeah, we on the yeah. same page. So, so I thought you're saying the opposite, sorry. Oh, no, 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 sorry. Yeah, okay. yeah, you can okay. construct examples where the, inf you know kind of the information in the gradient query, like what it's gonna be. Yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Or you can count control it, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks, I'm gonna. Go get some uh, snacks too. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm gonna try to be by a bit later in the week. My my daughter is, has like uh, my uh, has a bit of a cold and hence can't go to daycare. Um, oh, but uh, okay. but if um if that's resolved, I'll, I'll show. That'd be good. I'm here until Wednesday, so if you, okay. uh, if okay. you make it before then. Okay, excellent. Bye. Okay. Bye. Um, Thank you.